Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Let's learn, guys. All right. Uh, the Falklands, the remote island islands that triggered the first modern war. Thatcher, right? Uh, the original link to the video. How are you guys? Sorry. Good. I always forget to just say, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing well, guys. All right. The original link to the video, top of the description. Below that, link to the Discord. Would love to have you. Let's go. Fight a war, windswept. And co In hindsight, it seems like such a bizarre place to fight a war. Windswept and cold islands closer to Antarctica than to Europe. A place where hardly anyone lived that didn't offer much economic or strategic value to anybody. And yet, for three months in 1982, the Falkland Islands were all anyone was talking about as the world watched as the militaries of the United Kingdom and Argentina slugged it out over a place most people would have trouble locating on a map. When asked why the war was being fought, the Argentinians said that they were reclaiming sovereign territory illegally occupied by a colonizer while the british argued they were rescuing British subjects held hostage by an invading force. The war in the Falklands was the first modern conflict, a proving ground for new weapons and ideas. Guys, I, I feel like the Falklands war was from what I, it seems like a war that for Argentina they saw the you know the diminishing of of empire holdings uh, around the world from the French or, or I guess America to you know French and and British and so they saw their chance and for the British it was like a all right you either stand up here or you just look like a weak falling apart uh giant power just, and so it was like an ego thing for Great Britain and it was more of a let's take a chance and and it, we might be able to get it back without much trouble for the Argentinians. But then, does that make sense? Am I wrong there? It was studied by military tacticians from all over the world. It was a war fought with satellites and advanced jet fighter aircraft with missiles and laser-guided bombs. It was a war followed in real time from thousands of miles away from the action thanks to television, sometimes to the detriment of the men fighting in it. But one thing the modern model of warfare couldn't change was how deadly it was. Over 900 lives were lost in nine weeks of conflict. By the time it was over, the sleepy little islands would never be the same again. Like many other places colonized by Europeans during the Age of Exploration, the small archipelago 300 miles to the east of the South American coastline was uninhabited when English explorer John Strong came upon it in 1690. Strong names the channel between the two largest islands in the group Falkland Sound after his boss, the Viscount Falkland, treasurer of the navy. The islands themselves eventually took on the name Falklands. They remained uninhabited until the 1760s, when colonies were established by the French and British. The French then surrendered their claim to the Spanish, who kicked out the British, who came back and then left again in 1774. The Spanish left the islands during the Napoleonic Wars, then the islands were claimed by Argentina, who maintained an intermittent presence until the British came back and kicked them out in 1833, asserting that they had never renounced their original 1690 claim over the place. Following this convoluted custody battle, the Falklands remained under British rule for the next 150 years. The islands were settled largely by Scottish and Welsh immigrants who described their new home as being remarkably similar to New Zealand. And like New Zealand, the staple industry for the Falkland Islands would prove to be raising sheep for wool farming, starting with the formation of the Falkland Islands Company in 1851. Once the Panama Canal opened and ships stopped traveling around the tip of South America, sheep farming would become the Falklands' only industry, with over 80% of the land area used for the practice and an average of 300 sheep for every resident of the island. The only town of any size in the Falklands is Stanley. Over 80% of the island's population live there, though uh, that isn't saying much. In 1982, that figure was 1,500 people. The rest is colloquially referred to as camp. The dozens of small settlements, mostly sheep farms, that are dotted throughout both East and West Falkland. At the time, no roads outside of Stanley were paved, and in many places, no roads existed at all. People got around on horseback or maybe by dirt bike if they could afford one. Almost everything needs to be imported. Food, fuel, building materials, vehicles, furniture, electronic equipment. Quite simply, the Falkland Islands are as close to the middle of nowhere as it is possible to get on Earth.
Argentina had routinely protested British possession of the Falkland Islands, which it calls Islas Malvinas, ever since they first showed up in 1833. The government asserted that it is a sovereign part of their country, including it in official maps and regularly lodging protests at the United Nations about it. With the collapse of the great European empire starting in the 1950s, Argentina believed that now they had a chance to pursue their claim to the islands, arguing that repossessing them would be part of decolonization efforts. In 1965, the UN passed a resolution calling on Great Britain and Argentina to resolve their dispute over the islands themselves through dialogue, essentially taking no position on the sovereignty. I was kind of right there, right? No? The, the decolonization efforts. In 1965, the UN passed a resolution calling on Great Britain and Argentina to resolve their dispute over the islands themselves I'm through not right dialogue, off. essentially taking no position on the sovereignty debate. Over the course of 17 years, the governments of the two countries held talks about the islands never resolving anything. Ah, I didn't listen to that. I don't... Arguing that repossessing them would be part of decolonization efforts. In 1965, the UN passed a resolution calling on Great Britain and Argentina to resolve their dispute over the islands themselves through dialogue, essentially taking no position on the sovereignty debate. Over the course of 17 years, the governments of the two countries held talks about the islands never resolving anything, though the British Foreign Office privately advocated handing over the islands, viewing them as bringing little value to the country and, in fact, acting as a hindrance to trade with South America. The trouble was nobody could convince the Falkland Islanders that becoming part of Argentina was a good idea. Unfortunately for the Argentinians, international opinion on who should govern a place had moved past the issue of sovereignty or who owns it, instead relying on the principle of self-determination, that is, letting the residents of a place decide for themselves what kind of government they wish to have. The trouble with the Falklands is that it wasn't a colony in Africa or Asia with a large indigenous population ruled over by a European power. The previously uninhabited islands group that was settled by people of European descent, it was obviously too small to be its own nation. So the only question was which nation the people of the Falkland Islands wanted to be a part of. The answer to that question has always been Great Britain, whenever anyone asked them. The 1,800 residents of the Falkland Islands had almost no connection to Argentina. Yeah, it seems uh, very similar to the Gibraltar debate in, you know, all right, Gibraltar, do you want to go to, to Spain finally, back to Spain? And it's like, well, they all vote to be with Britain. And is anyone sh surprised that, you know, people who are usually not sort of adverse to change wouldn't vote <laughs> to, to just stay with Britain when they're British, they speak English, they have a lot of British or culturally British and, and anyone is shocked that hmm, they, they want to stay with Britain. Well, yeah, uh, that's obvious, right? Few people, 800 residents of the Falkland Islands had almost no connection to Argentina. Few people there spoke Spanish, almost none were of Argentinian or even South American descent, and they considered themselves to be British subjects, even if they were more than 8,000 miles from London. And whenever anyone suggested that the Falkland Islands should be turned over to the Argentinians, the Falkland Islanders lobbied passionately in Parliament to make sure that it didn't happen. So, at the start of 1982, the negotiations over the Falklands were hopelessly deadlocked, with most of the rest of the world confused as to why it even mattered that much in the first place. And then, to the surprise of everyone, Argentina decided to try and force the issue. Uh, I, I don't... It, it seems kind of naive to be like, why is it so important? Well, you're a... You, you are the... Britain, you were... It is undoubted... It is undoubtable that Britain is much, much less powerful today and, you know, in the 80s compared to World War II and pre-World War II uh, days. And so when you, you are seeing your country, country kind of uh, consistently losing parts of its former, you know, if you want to say its former glory or, or whatnot, then at some point they're going to be like, well, we have to, you know, stand up and fight for something or else we're just going to keep being taken advantage of. Look, whether or not you want to say how Brit Britain got control of it in the first place was through, you know, colonization and stuff. But uh, again, I, I just want to think about why Britain would, would defend this place and why Argentina and Britain were fighting over this seemingly sort of irrelevant uh, island in, in the South Atlantic. Well, 
just think about it for a second. You, you're, you, you don't want to be continuously seen as some sort of post-colonial pushover. And so you got to kind of stand up at some point would be my, my guess as to why. And then for Argentina, for obvious reasons, they just see it as an Argentinian island. So saying, you know, wh why are they doing this? Seems kind of like you're not even thinking about the bigger picture. Argentina had been ruled sense. by a military junta since 1976, a junta that was growing increasingly unpopular at home because of a worsening economic crisis as well as brutal repressions instituted by the military as part of their dirty war against so-called subversive elements, which led to the deaths of between 9,000 and 30,000 people over a 10-year spree of state-sponsored terrorism. The junta, yes. headed by General Leopoldo Gautieri, believed that reviving the issue of Los Malvinas would distract the Argentine populars from the discontent at home, lending legitimacy to the military government and instigating a wave of patriotic fervor throughout Argentina. They decided to invade the Falklands, occupying them by force. They believed that while the British would protest vociferously, uh, they wouldn't care enough to respond militarily to the occupation. On April 2, 1982, Argentinian troops landed in and around Stanley. They quickly overwhelmed the small garrison of Royal Marine Station there, securing the surrender of Governor Rex Hunt after a two-hour firefight. The Argentines also occupied South Georgia Island, a largely uninhabited island located 870 miles east of the Falklands. In London, despite observing the increased buildup of Argentinian forces, the government of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was still largely caught by surprise when news reached them of the invasion of the Falklands. Many ministers were incredulous that Argentina would take such a drastic step. The British asked for a meeting of the UN Security Council, which issued Resolution 502, calling for an immediate withdrawal of all Argentinian forces from the Falklands. Anticipating that Argentina would refuse, Thatcher decided, after conferring with her cabinet, to send troops to the South Atlantic to retake the islands by force. The biggest problem with waging war for the Falklands was the huge distances involved. The Falklands were 8,000 miles from Britain, meaning that everything needed to mount an invasion would need to be shipped down there far from friendly ports. Their forward operating base would be Ascension Islands, another isolated British outpost situated roughly halfway between Africa and South America, but still 3,800 miles from the Falklands. The British Naval Task Force, assembled as part of Operation Corporate, centered around two aircraft carriers, HMS Hermes and HMS Invincible which carried only 20 Sea Harrier fighter bombers. Uh, this would be the first combat test for the Harrier jump jet, a new kind of warplane that was able to take off from the deck of an aircraft carrier vertically like a helicopter. It would be facing an Argentinian air force that could operate from land bases only a few hundred miles. I didn't realize we had that vertical takeoff capability of jets um, that far back. It would be facing an Argentinian air force that could operate from land bases only a few hundred miles from the Falklands, not to mention uh, there were ten times as many of them. The carriers and their escorts began to set sail from Portsmouth on April the 5th, only three days after the Argentinian invasion. They were joined by two cruise ships pressed into service as troop carriers, bringing two brigades of infantry uh, that would conduct the land portion of the campaign. The task force assembled at Ascension, which was now one of the busiest airports in the world, constantly bringing in men and material for the war effort. In addition to hundreds of aircraft, the total naval strength of the task force would number 127 ships, including cargo vessels borrowed from civilian shipping companies and converted North Sea and Channel ferries. Weeks of diplomatic negotiations went nowhere. Just as the hunter expected, the occupation of the Falklands was wildly popular within Argentina, and they had no intention of giving them up. On the other hand, the British public, for the most part, was behind their government's actions as well. So when the carrier battle group, commanded by Rear Admiral John Sandy Woodward set sail from Ascension on April the 18th. It was with the intention of going to war. It was the first amphibious operation of this scale conducted by the Royal Navy since the ill-fated Suez Canal expedition in 1956. While the carriers uh, were still moving into position, a small group of commandos were preparing to recapture South Georgia Island from the Argentinians. The shooting war began in earnest on April the 25th when a submarine, ARA Santa Fe, was spotted and attacked by British helicopters, damaging it severely enough that it was forced to dock at the main South Georgia and port of Greit Viken. Commandos already on the island had surrounded the Argentinian garrison, and a display of force was enough to convince them and the crew 
of the submarine to surrender without further resistance. It was a cheap victory for the British. They had lost two helicopters that had crashed during the operation but suffered no casualties. The Argentinians lost one sailor killed, one wounded, and 155 captured in addition to losing the submarine. Meanwhile, the British battle group began their own operation to recapture the Falklands on May the 1st. Their first objective was to attempt to establish air and naval superiority over the area. The government had previously declared an exclusion zone with any Argentinian aircraft or ships coming within 200 miles of the island subject to attack by the task force. Argentina, meanwhile, scrambled both their air force and their navy to try and destroy the British ships, especially the two aircraft carriers. If they could take those out, the rest of the task force would be forced to withdraw. The first major casualty of the war was the Argentinian cruiser ARA General Belgrano, which was hit by two torpedoes fired by a British submarine on May the 2nd and sank, killing 323 men. This had the effect of forcing the rest of the Argentinian Navy back into port, and they would play no farther part in the war. But their air attacks from the Argentinian mainland uh, were stepped up, including planes armed with the deadly Exocet anti-ship missile. One of these struck the British destroyer HMS Sheffield on May the 4th, killing 20 sailors and forcing the rest to abandon ship as she was consumed by fire. While attempting to tow the ship back to Ascension Island, she sank, the first Royal Navy ship lost to enemy fire since World War II. After several weeks of inconclusive air attacks on both sides, the British prepared to send their troops ashore on East I don't Auckland. know why I'm shocked. Like, uh, something about the... the the fact that it's Britain and Argentina, which seems like, a, at first glance, a kind of odd matchup until you learn more about the history. And that the fact that it's in the 1980s and just seeing ships exploded and like hundreds of casualties. Although, yeah, I, yeah, it's a war. What, what do I expect? I'm kind of thinking, yeah, you, you idiot. What, what do you think is going to happen? But it's still kind of like a whoa. This is a war. This is a legitimate war right here. And I... Does that make sense? I there were almost as air attacks on both sides. The British prepared to send their troops ashore on East Falkland, where almost all of the Argentinian troops were garrisoned. Instead of landing the troops near Stanley, as the Argentinians had done, Major General Jeremy Moore of the Royal Marines, the land forces commander, chose to land at San Carlos, a small settlement on the opposite side of the island from the capital. This operation began on May the 21st, with the Navy ships positioned to protect the landings from Argentinian aircraft. The Battle of San Carlos was mostly fought between the British ships and the Argentinian Air Force, which repeatedly bombed the ships in the harbor, attempting to disrupt the landings. The place would be forever after known as Bomb Alley. It lasted for four days, with the British successfully repelling the Argentines and establishing a beachhead, shooting down 22 aircraft in the process. But the victory came at a price. Two frigates, HMS Ardent and HMS Antelope, and the destroyer HMS Coventry were all hit and sank, while 49 men were killed. Meanwhile, another Exocet attack sank the cargo ship Atlantic Conveyor, killing 12 crew members and sending a lot of supplies to the bottom, including nine helicopters. The Argentinians made one more attempt to sink one of the carriers with their last Exocet missile on May the 30th, but they missed, ending the most direct threat to the task force. Now the focus of the war would switch to the land operation. Guys, I have to pee really bad. I'll, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I wash my hands. The Argentinian army was mostly made up of conscripts, 19-year-old men that were required to serve 12 months in uniform overseen by career officers and NCOs. The class of 1963 had been supplemented by the class of 1962 for the Falklands War, as the command of Brigadier General Mario Mendenez grew to 13,000 soldiers, though some of the army's best units, including battalions trained to fight in the Andes Mountains that might have been better suited to the cold conditions of the Falklands, were left in Argentina because of border tensions with neighboring Chile. The young privates were known affectionately by the Argentine public as Chicos. Initially, Chicos boys. Um, so Argentina had some tension with Chile. They, they, the, the tension with Chile was 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 enough to warrant not moving troops to fight a a current ongoing war with Britain and if tensions were that high was there any talks between Chile and and Great Britain for like some joint offensive or something 
The young privates were known affectionately by the Argentine public as Chicos. Initially opposing the Argentinians were the 5,000 men of Britain's Three Commando Brigade, a mixed unit of Royal Marines and soldiers from the Parachute Regiment. It was quite a bit of rivalry between the two. The Marines referred to the Paras as Cherry Berries because of their red berries, while the Paras retaliated with cabbage heads for the Marines since they wore green ones. But they were among the UK's best ground troops, the country having transitioned to an all-volunteer military in 1963. Some had seen service in Northern Ireland during the worst of the Troubles and uh, were highly trained, but most had never been to war before. The Argentines were concentrated in two areas on East Falkland. The bulk of their forces were in and around Stanley in the east, while a sizable detachment of 1,200 troops were stationed at Goose Green on a narrow isthmus on the western side of the island. General Moore's plan called for the troops to march overland across the island to surround the Stanley defenses, but first Goose Green needed to be taken. The job was assigned to the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment. Two Paris commander, Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones, wasn't a happy man on the night before the attack. The BBC had mistakenly announced over the radio too early that Goose Green would be attacked by his unit, putting the Argentine defenders on alert. Jones threatened to sue everybody involved with the mess up when he got home. He never got the chance. The Battle of Goose Green was a blood affair that lasted for 15 hours. The powers had to make a frontal assault on prepared defense positions because of the narrowness of the terrain. 18 attackers were killed, including Colonel Jones, who would posthumously be awarded the Victoria Cross, the country's highest award for gallantry. Between 45 and 55 Argentinians were also killed, and over 100 were wounded before other battle was over, and the remaining soldiers, over 900 in all, surrendered. Victory in hands, the British troops advanced on Stanley, largely unopposed, until they reached a series of defensive positions on the outskirts of the town on high grounds. Three Commando Brigade was joined by Fire Brigade, which included battalions of the Scots and Welsh Guards who had been pulled from ceremonial duties guarding the Queen at Buckingham Palace to fight in the Falklands. The Gurkha Rifles, known for carrying a distinctive knife from Nepal called a cookery, were also involved. General Menendez and his remaining units were demoralized by this point in the conflict. Many of the soldiers had been led to believe that they would be met by an adoring Spanish-speaking crowd and Stanley waving Argentinian flags. Instead, they found a sullen populace that refused categorically to cooperate with the occupiers unless forced to. Many Falkland Islanders found themselves detained by the Argentinians because of worries they would engage in subversive activities, and the rest found their buildings, livestock, and food regularly stolen or damaged by the soldiers. But the war wasn't over yet. If they could hold the defensive perimeter in Stanley, uh, they could drag the war into the frigid southern hemisphere winter months, stretching the capabilities of the British task force and possibly leading to a negotiated end to the conflict. Air attacks continued despite heavy Argentinian losses, including a devastating strike on the troop ship Sir Galahad, killing 48 men. Those killed were mainly members of the Welsh Guards. The battalion was forced into reserve for the remainder of the conflict, while the wrecked Sir Galahad was towed out to sea and sunk as a war grave. The sixth ship and the fleet sunk during the war. Still, this setback only delayed the final battle for Stanley by two days, two nights of battles on five Argentinian defensive positions. June the 11th saw the capture of Mount Harriet, two sisters, and Mount Longdon by the Royal Marines and three para. And on the night of June the 12th, the Scots Guards captured Mount Tumbledown, while the veterans of Goose Green, two para, captured Wireless Ridge. With the capture of these positions, the Argentinian defense collapsed and soldiers began to retreat into Stanley itself. General Menendez had orders to continue to resist, but he knew his position was hopeless at this point and called for a ceasefire on June the 14th. The same day, he surrendered his command to General Moore. Over 11,000 Argentinians were taken prisoner, forced to give up their weapons, and shipped home on the same cruise liner that had sent their captors to the Falklands. Prime Minister Thatcher announced in the House of Commons that the war was over to public jubilation. The Falklands War lasted two and a half months, but was unexpectedly bloody. The British lost six ships, 24 helicopters, 10 harriers, and 255 killed, including three Falkland Islanders who were mistakenly hit by a British shell during the Battle for Stanley. More than half of the Argentinian 649 dead were lost on the sunken General Belgrano. They also lost six other ships, 25 helicopters, and 75 fixed-wing aircraft. But the true lasting effect of the war would be felt in the political futures of both countries. In Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher's approval ratings increased dramatically in the wake of the war, and her Conservative Party won the parliamentary elections next year. She'd remain in power until 1990 and given the nickname 
the Iron Lady because of her hard reputation earned in the conflict. In Argentina, the propaganda bubble the military junta had built about the invincibility of their forces was popped dramatically. General Gautieri would be sacked as president soon after the surrender. So, uh, as someone not not British, obviously, and um, just learning about the subject, I I don't want to say things that I just I don't have the knowledge to really say, but uh, I'm gonna say it, and I hope you can. Well, it's not really a thing that I say. It's more of a question of of do you think this was worth it? And before you answer. I think the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to say, no, why are you sending uh, British young men to die 8,000 miles away over a little barren island with sheep on it in the South Atlantic? I get that, but I also have the question of the repercussions of not doing it are much more difficult to realize than the, the repercussions of doing it in the loss of soldiers and whatnot. So... I don't think it's as easy as it might seem because at a certain point down the line you'll you'll be seen as as weak and I don't know I just I'm curious to see what the majority of you guys think about the Falklands War and it wasn't that long ago if anyone had any role whatsoever in the Falklands War I'd love to see what you have to say we're in the military dictatorship General Gautieri would be sacked as president soon after the surrender and the military dictatorship itself collapsed the next year, leading to the first democratic elections in a decade. The Argentinian military has never regained the prestige that it held for most of the 20th century, and diplomatic relations with the UK would not be restored until 1989. The Falkland Islands, meanwhile, was suddenly flooded with government funding to improve all sorts of infrastructure previously held off for fear of agitating the Argentinians. The most dramatic improvement was the construction of an airbase at Mount Pleasant as part of the Fortress Falklands program. Today, the islands have a permanent military garrison of 1,200 soldiers as well as a squadron of fighter jets and a naval patrol vessel. The economic situation also improved with the establishment of an economic exclusivity zone around the islands. Today, the Falklands make far more money in the deep sea fishing trade than they do from sheep farming. In more recent decades, surveys have been made within the zone looking for oil deposits, though none have been found yet. The war did leave scars, though. Equipment from the conflict was scattered all over East Falkland. The presence of 25,000 landmines rendered entire sections of the land unused. The last of these would not be cleared until 2020. Most of the British war dead were repatriated to the UK or buried at sea. But there is a war cemetery at San Carlos for 14 men buried where they fell, including Colonel Jones. The Argentinians refused to allow their dead to be returned, and so they were buried on East Falkland in a separate cemetery. With the passage of time, the bad feelings engendered by the war faded. The UK and Argentina are on generally friendly terms now. The most heated rivalry tends to be on the football pitch. Argentina continues to push their claim for sovereignty over the Falklands, though they have publicly stated that they will never again try to use force to take them. The British government, on the other hand, considers sovereignty of the Falklands a settled issue. In a referendum held in 2013, 99.8% of the residents voted in favor of the islands remaining a territory of the United Kingdom. Yeah, that's Perhaps the <laughs> biggest legacy of the Falklands no War was its effect on military thinking. Most of the world's navies, noting how vulnerable surface ships are to aircraft strikes, have installed advanced close in weapon systems ciws to defend themselves from attack naval spending by the way is this where they keep the bullets is this giant drum on the side of these these mini guns on ships is that all for bullet bullet storage or, or is that the bullets and if that is the bullets then then what is this for some sort of satellite maybe they need to protect from the elements or, or something? Advanced close-in weapon systems, CIWS, to defend themselves from attack. Naval spending in the UK was increased, and plans to get rid of the country's aircraft carriers were shelved. The land battles, meanwhile, have been generally viewed as textbook examples of successful small unit tactics and proved the value of a smaller, highly trained volunteer army instead of large armies of conscripts. In summation, the Falkland Islands may have been the strangest place to fight a war, and nobody may have cared about the place before, but the war was fought, and they certainly care about the place now. It's just a shame that it took the blood of hundreds of young men to make people care, and that the legacy of this remote outpost of civilization will be forever scarred with the memories of the world's first modern war. Really cool video. Um, I think I asked most of my questions during the video, so I don't have many others to ask.
Um, but very fascinating topic that I even now still need to learn more about, right? It only seen a few short videos. So geographics, love the channel. Hope you guys are all doing well. I uh, can't wait to see your comments and I'll see you next time. All right. Bye guys.